Chapter 18. Turns out, not using the number is harder than Jess anticipates, especially when he's alone with nothing but memories of his homeboy. He's hanging out after school in Doc's classroom to avoid making the call a few days later when SJ bursts through the door like she's being chased by rabid dogs. The sight of her punches the air right out of Jess's lungs. They haven't really talked since the funeral a couple of weeks ago, but seeing her so... SJ? Well, it centers him in a way he doesn't expect. You guys! Yes, Sarah Jane? Says Doc, the picture of calm. Do you have any idea what's going on right now? Can't say we do, Doc replies. Where's your TV remote? Doc pulls the remote from his desk drawer and passes it to her. Once the TV is on and tuned to the right channel, Jess finds it hard to breathe for a different reason. There on the screen, big and bold and bright and blatant, is a picture from Jared's Halloween political statement turned brush with death. Of course, everyone else, Blake and the Klansmen included, has been cropped out of the version making national news. It just shows Justice McAllister as thug extraordinaire. We've heard about his grades, SAT scores, and admission to an Ivy League school, the anchor says. But a picture speaks a thousand words. This kid grew up in the same neighborhood as the young man accused of murdering Garrett Tyson's partner, more or less on a whim. You gotta be kidding me, Jess says. People all over the country have rallied to the cause, wearing Justice for Jam t-shirts, Jam being Justice and Manny, and riding with their music loud from 1219 until 1221 every Saturday afternoon to commemorate the time of the argument between them and Garrett. But if there's one thing Jess knows from the Shamar Carson and to various cases, it really doesn't take more than a photo to sway mass opinion. SJ crosses her arms, and the three of them lean in to hear the analysis of some anti-gang violence pundit who appears on a split screen with the anchor. I mean, it's obvious this kid was leading a double life, the guy is saying. You know what they say. Steven, you can remove the kid from the thug life, but you can't remove the thug life from the kid. S.J., you son of a bitch. Doc, shh. S.J., this is blatant defamation of character. Pundit. There are all these reports about how great a kid Emmanuel Rivers was, but if this was the company he kept, well, I really don't know, Stephen. Just shakes his head. Unbelievable. Stephen. We've received some reports that this other young man mentioned, uh, Quan Banks, is a relative of Emmanuel Rivers. You know anything about that? Pundit. It wouldn't surprise me if both boys had ties to Banks. Who's to say Officer Tyson didn't see them on the screen the night his partner was murdered right before his eyes? You have to put the pieces together, Stephen. Garrett Tyson and Tommy Castillo respond to a complaint about loud music, there's a Range Rover parked in the driveway of the offending domicile, and some thug kid pops out of the back seat with a shotgun. Now that we're learning about all these connections, who's to say it wasn't the same Range Rover Emmanuel Rivers was driving? Officer Tyson says boys pointed a gun at him, and after seeing this picture, I can't say I'd put it past them. As the news cuts to another segment, SJ turns the television off. Doc looks too furious to speak. All Just can do is put his head in his hands. Effing Jared, SJ says. If that cretin wouldn't have... Ugh. SJ's phone rings and Just lifts his head. When she sees the screen, her eyebrows jump to the ceiling. Who is it? Just says. SJ holds out the phone. Douche Nugget is the name displayed. Speak of the spawn of Satan and he shall make his presence known. Jared? Just asks. Yep. I'll take it in the hallway. As she pulls the door closed, Just hears her yell. Seen the news today, asshole? Doc throws an arm around Jess's shoulder and gives him a shake. Want to talk about it? <sighs> this is some bullshit, Doc. Jess kicks the desk beside him and it topples onto its side. Yep. Doc writes it. Is it not enough that Manny's dead, man? It's like these people want Garrett to get away with it. Jess shakes his head. I knew I should have said no to Jared's idea. Definitely shouldn't have let him take that picture, but uh, I ignored how I was feeling about it because I was trying to be like... He grits his teeth. Like Martin? Just nods. You still writing your letters? Nah, man. Why not? 
Just shrugs. Don't see the point. My experiment obviously didn't work. Don't want to think about it anymore. I see. You know what's crazy, Doc? What's that? I've got one memory of the day everything happened. Sharp pains in my chest and shoulder and then not being able to breathe. In that moment when I thought I was dying, it hit me. Despite how good of a dude Martin was, they still killed him, man. Doc nods. I know. But I don't think knowing he'd be killed would have changed the way he lived, Jess. He challenged the status quo and helped bring about some change. Pretty sure that was his goal. Wouldn't you agree? All I know is he and Manny are dead and I'm being cast as the bad guy. I get that. Look, Jess, people need the craziness in the world to make some sort of sense to them. That idiot, Pundit, would rather believe you and Manny were thugs than believe a 20-year veteran cop made a snap judgment based on skin color. He identifies with the cop. If the cop is capable of murder, it means he's capable of the same. He can't accept that. Well, that's his hang-up. Shouldn't be my problem. You're right. But it is your problem, because you're affected by it. I know it's shitty. Excuse my language. And it's definitely not fair. But these people have to justify Garrett's actions. They need to believe you're a bad guy who got what he deserved in order for their world to keep spinning the way it always has. How does that help me, Doc? It doesn't. Just shakes his head again. Trey's number flashes through his mind. So why even try to be good? You can't change how other people think and act, but you're in full control of you. When it comes down to it, the only question that matters is this. If nothing in the world ever changes, what type of man are you going to be? A dense silence settles over the room. But just as Just is about to speak again, SJ comes back in. For a minute, she just stands with her back against the doorframe and her eyebrows furrowed. SJ? Doc says. Everything all right? She snaps out of the daze. <sighs> Ass clown Christensen seems to be shedding his douchey skin, you guys. Huh? From Jess. SJ comes over and drops down in the empty seat next to him. She turns to look at him, right in his eyes. He wants to clear this up, she says. Wait, Jess shakes his head. Back up, I'm confused. Jared, that was him on the phone. I got that part. Well, he's pissed about what they did with the Halloween picture. Says his dad is calling some people so they'll show the entire shot. Blake's clan idiocy included. Just doesn't know what to say. Isn't this the same guy who was about to press charges against Manny for the beatdown he got? Why the hell is he being Mr. Noble all of a sudden? What do you think is up with him? I honestly couldn't tell you. He seemed a little... disillusioned? Like, I picked up the phone and called him an asshole and it sounded like he just kind of crumpled. I can't even disagree with you, SJ, he said. This is all my fault. I had to look at my phone to check who I was talking to. Just his jaw clenches. So now he wants to be the great white hope. Correct me if I'm wrong, Doc interrupts. But Manny and Jared were good friends, right? Just shrugs. Yeah, I guess. It occurred to either of you that maybe the guy doesn't want his friend's name dragged through the mud any more than you do? Neither SJ nor Jess responds. Cut Jared some slack. He's grieving too. Jess's eyes drift across the room to where Manny and Jared used to sit side by side in socio evo. Yeah. Okay, Doc. I need to hit the men's room. Doc stands. Excuse me. When Doc leaves, Jess's awareness of SJ's presence kicks up a notch. He looks at her hands on the desk and sees that her nails are painted green. It makes him smile. During one of their tournament prep sessions at her house, they'd taken a break to make a snack run to the local drugstore. Just before they checked out, SJ asked Jess what his favorite color was. When he told her green, she ran off and came back with a bottle of nail polish. Justice clears his throat. 
<clears throat> so. Wait, I need to say something. Okay. She turns to face him. I owe you an apology for bailing. She picks at her nails. After the tournament, with no explanation, I'm sorry. Oh. Some emotion he doesn't recognize surges in his chest. He's on dangerous ground, and he knows it, especially considering the way she's looking at him. You, uh, mind explaining now? I panicked. You panicked. Well, there was Mellow, and I didn't know where you stood with her or how I fit. Anyway, point is, it won't happen again. Okay. I mean it, Jess. I want to be here for you. Anything you need. A friend, a hug, whatever. Thanks, Jess. Jess bumps her with his shoulder. I really appreciate it. She nods. So we're good? Yeah, Jess smiles. We're good. VP released for Rabble Rousing by Sonia Kitress for the Tribune. Julian Rivers, Executive Vice President of Davidson Wells Financial Corporation, has stepped down from his position following troubling reports of his involvement in the Justice for Jam movement. According to CEO Chuck Wallace, photographs of Mr. Rivers on the front lines of an Atlanta march that shut down traffic for hours last week triggered the loss of several high-profile clients and approximately $80 million in revenue for the asset management firm. In a press release yesterday afternoon, Wallace stated, While we respect the gravity of the tragic loss of a child, involvement in publicly disruptive activity is grounds for investigation and potential dismissal. Mr. Rivers has been a tremendous asset at Davidson Wells for well over 19 years, and while we hate to see him go, we've mutually agreed to part ways. Rivers' son, Emmanuel, was killed in a shooting during a dispute over loud music in late January. A trial date for the shooter, who was indicted last month, has not been set.